This meeting is being recorded. All right. Hi, everyone. Tonight, we're going to talk about um, improving your return on investment with short term rentals. And uh, we're going to talk about different ways to do that, how you go about the lending process, the logistics behind it, um, like management, things like that. And we have a couple panelists tonight who are going to help us answer some questions. This is an interactive webinar. So if you have questions or comments, please feel free to ask them. You can ask them through your microphone if you want, or if you're not comfortable talking, I totally understand. Use the chat and we will get to everyone's questions. All right, we're going to start with the panelists. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. First up, we have Chris. Chris, I'm a lender with Lakeview Mortgage. Um, next, we have Sean Dempsey. Hey there, I'm Sean. I'm with Managed BNB. We uh, manage other people's Airbnbs. Awesome, thank you. Sean is, um, I. what was the other gentleman's name? Todd, I think? Tim, Tim will not be joining us tonight. Unfortunately, his wife has an ultrasound uh, that had to be scheduled for tonight. So I, I will be filling in for him and and uh, try to, you know, fill, you know, his shoes as best I can. All right, that's okay, thank you. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started with the first slide. Oh, I guess the second slide. <laughs> okay, pretty simple question. Why should I own a short-term rental property? So let's throw it out to the to panelists. Sean, you have an answer to that? Yes, I do. Uh, yeah. Can I just jump um, in? I couldn't hear the first person at all. Whatever you just said, no idea. The first panelist? Somebody said something. I don't know who spoke. Um, he asked somebody to respond. I don't that, know what he said. That was me. I, I, asked, I asked Sean if he would respond to that question. Hey. Hey Jack. So let, let's. I'm, I'm going to slow down a little bit. Uh, by the way, I do think your mic is not plugged in, Jack, because to to uh, not Jody, but whatever <laughs> um, point there was some issue with the with the uh, audio there a little bit. But I did want to just kind of take a moment before I kind of jump into some of the material and just basically open up some conversation around um, maybe format of tonight. Um, my goal, and let me know. Candace and, and Jack, if you disagree, but I'd love to make this a very interactive, very Q&A focused discussion. Um, I uh, have been doing this a long time. I would love to basically be peppered with as many questions as folks are willing to pepper me with. Um, my goal is to be as instructive and uh, informational as possible. And you know, certainly there's format to the slides and I will respect that and we'll definitely be answering all these in turn. But I do want to um, just open up the conversation, if it's okay and permissible, for anyone who does want to ask a question outside of uh, the material or want to stop me at any time because I do get long-winded like I am being now. So if if there aren't any concerns with that, or if there, I, why, why don't I put it the other way? It, does anyone have any objections to kind of that format just so we keep it informal and keep it fun? No, not at all. Like I said, we do want this to be very interactive. We encourage lots of questions. Okay, good. <laughs> That's what I love. Okay, cool. So I'll take the first question. Um, so why should I own a short-term rental property? Well, this question is going to be different for everybody. I don't think there's any right, wrong, or right or wrong, wrong way to answer this question. I will answer this in the way that um, got me into this space. And I think hopefully it fosters some conversation from that. So one reason why I wanted to own short-term rentals as a investment opportunity for myself and my businesses that I've built around uh, short-term rentals or STRs as they're known in the common parlance um, is because of the lucrative nature of short-term rentals. Um, I'm, not, I'm a capitalist, I guess I'll, I'll be very front open with that right now. I'm a libertarian. I think probably a number of you guys are as well. And we are really trying to maximize the most amount of value that we get for our time and our money. I don't think any investor would have a problem with that uh, statement. Um, and short-term rentals are, to me, and uh, I think objectively speaking, the best bang for your buck when it comes to owning an asset um, or certain types of assets, that is, 
you can get anywhere between six and 12 times the, uh, the amount of rental income on the short-term marketplace as you get on what's called the long-term marketplace or just a standard you know, renter, um, rental agreement. Um, so that's kind of my first, second, and third answer to, the, <laughs> to this question. I think it's a very important one and we can go into the specifics of why it's so lucrative. Um, the other reason it's, it's helpful to, or I think it's a good reason to own a short-term rental is that you don't get bogged down into, you know, I think it's a double-edged sword. When you get in a long-term agreement with somebody, if it's the right person, then God bless you and be, and be happy for that. But if it's the wrong person, getting out of a long-term lease is one of the most nightmarish experiences possible. I've been there, I've done that, and I will never do it again, to be quite honest. Um, when you have short-term rentals, you're a flash in the pan. I mean, you want to build up some level of, um, I have a lot of repeat customers come back to me every single year, sometimes multiple times a year in my, my properties. But I don't have to worry about having to have six to 12 months worth of hell. I can have a weekend or at most a week of, of, you know, <laughs> of, of, a, of a situation that's disple displeasurable and then they're off and I move on to the next renters. Um, I could probably actually answer this question by 12 different ways, but I'll stop there and, and probably open this up for questions. But I, I think that those are probably the two biggest reasons why I like short-term rentals. I have a question. I mean, it's not directly related. It's related to something you said. I mean, I'm, I am curious about the, the long-term projection of short-term rentals. Right now, yes, it's lucrative, but what if it takes a year to get it in place? Is it still going to be, I mean, I know you don't know, but how, how can you think about that? <clears throat> well, I think you got to look at the landscape, right? So short-term rentals are relatively new. Um, and they're as a result of anything new entering into any um, marketplace, um, it, it, it starts by being very lucrative, as I was mentioning before. And that does, um, I say plateau at some point. The landscape right now is also very tumultuous when it comes to government and uh, city um, policy. Like there are some cities right here in New Hampshire, even the live free or die state that that disallow short term rentals. Portsmouth being a great example. They will not your grandfather in if you got them, you're, you're great. But ninety nine percent of people who want to do it can't do it. Um, so the landscape is very important. And then the other side of it that you were asking about is the the I'd say the onboarding process if it's going to take you you know upwards of a year to really get a property ready as i think we were saying yeah you probably have to evaluate whether or not that is the right fit i mean if, if you for example don't have any furniture don't have the ability to find vendors um you're starting off brand new whereas you know you could get someone in that place right away that to me is a no-brainer you probably want to you know take your time and figure out and do your, you know, cross your T's and dot your I's before you get involved. Um, because there is things to short term rentals um, that are very, you know, crucial, like you want to have a fully furnished property, you can't be selling it barren. And so I think that's probably referring to, you know, I think that's, I don't know if that's directly answering your question, but that's probably a piece of what you're talking about, I imagine. So Sean, can you hear me now? Yes, uh, a little better, but yeah, go ahead. Okay. I switched microphones. But um, uh, Obviously, with a short-term rental, there's, there's uh, uh, at least different and other reoccurring operating expenses. He um, indicated that there'd be six to twelve times um, earnings. Um, how is how are the uh, the expense side of, of the earnings and short short-term rentals going? Great question. Because um, I don't mean to say, make it sound like it's all flowers and unicorns, because you're right, there's an expense model, there's another flip side of that coin. So a short term rental, just to list some off, have a variety of expenditures that you wouldn't have as a long term rental. Um, one thing is, for example, you want to get regular um, cleaning services established. Did he freeze? Looks like yeah. It. <laughs> He's okay, Sean, Sean froze <laughs> up. <laughs> He's got stage fright. He'll be back. Yeah, we'll just give him a second. Do you guys want me to advance the slide? Well, yeah. 
just wait a second, uh, see if he comes back. We can, um, there's a few other, a few other things that I think we should, you know, should cover um, here. Okay. Um, like, um, any back? No. Well, I think uh, one of the questions, one of the questions I hope we get, get him back is, is um, where do you get booking? Um, Airbnb is only one site. Um, anybody else know any other sites? Oh, I'm sorry about that, guys. You're back. Okay. <laughs> so um, go ahead. You're going, we, I kind of picked up a different topic while you were gone, but go ahead and I'll ask you that question in, in a second. You were talking about um, the operating expenses are, are slightly different. Yes, I'm, I'm so sorry what happened. I've never had that happen before. My internet just completely burped. I don't know how else to explain it. Um, anyway, long story short, I would think I was saying, so operational expenditures for short-term rental, the biggest one being cleaners. So you want to have a cleaning person or a cleaning company. Um, if not on staff, then certainly on, 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 the, on your speed dial, because um, they are going to be turning over your um, short-term rental or rental properties um, pretty much on a weekly basis. Um, they can make anywhere up from 20% to 20 to 30% of your, of your, um, your revenue um, as an, or as a percentage of your revenue is the cleaning fees involved with, uh, with a short-term rental. Um, you also want to have a bit more uh, expensive rent uh, insurance. So you actually have to work with a provider that allows short-term rentals. Um, not everyone in New Hampshire does. Uh, Liberty Mutual, for example, does not um, and at least not in New Hampshire, they do in every, almost every other state. Um, but there's there's various providers of insurance that only allow or that that allow um, short term rentals, and they're a bit more expensive than a standard um, insurance cost. Uh, you also have to work with a handyman uh, and or women, <laughs> and uh, and various you know individuals who will get say you know scrapped or um, various things repaired or, or handled, whether the, and as well as uh, various deliveries handled like propane if you need propane delivered or or your lawn mowed or things of that nature. So some of these expenses do carry over. There's probably a Venn diagram to be talked about between short term and long term, but um, I would say the expense model is is a bit different on the STR side. And um, while you were gone, I, I brought up the issue of the on the income side, and that um, being that Airbnb, uh, which we might all be familiar with, is only one of se several uh, services like that. Um, do, do you have the names of some other services like Airbnb? Yeah, Airbnb is becoming probably the most popular, but it's not the first in the in the market. The first one was actually uh, HomeAway, which has been bought out by VRBO. Um, they tend to rent out, not just generalize it too much, but they tend to rent out to a little bit more affluent folks um, and or folks that are looking to have longer stays, a week or more. Um, Booking.com is another one. Travelocity is another one. Um, there's all in all, I think, roughly 14 or 15 in the marketplace. We use personally a software called Hostfully um, to um, aggregate them. So you, you create a single listing and then it pushes them off to all platforms. And then How do you spell that? H O S T F U L L Y. I guessed right. Yep. <laughs> and uh, I'll probably be talking about this, you know, throughout this conversation. But again, our our company. So, well, I'll just put it out this way as a little plug. So we do manage other people's Airbnbs and their short-term rentals for them, and provide a lot of economies of scale for doing that. But um, we definitely encourage anyone to who is looking at getting into the space to to try it themselves, and and certainly. Uh, we can be a resource for you as you're getting started. And just defining the term short-term rental, um, when you say short-term, um, what's your definition of short-term? Um, it can be anything as short as a, a single day. <laughs> that is uh, Airbnb's definition, um, to as long as uh, several months. Um, the difference between short-term and long-term is one is contractual and one is not. Short-term does not have any long-term agreements in place. You are working on these platforms. The platforms like Airbnb or VRBO are providing all the liability insurance for you and, and the communication vehicle for, as well as the payment vehicle to make that happen. Um, whereas a long-term lease, you would have a contract for services and it's actually enforced by state law. Sweetie, I can't watch TV. Sweetie, I'll be right I with you. I can't watch TV. <laughs> Sorry about that. 
No problem. Uh, just just one Not more. Problem at all. <laughs> <laughs> just one more, Sean. I'm going to throw out to you is uh, furnished finders. Um, um, that typically deals with um, medical uh, ro uh, nurses who are contracting for short periods of time. I'm sure you're familiar with with them. You want to talk about them for a second because those contracts seem to be a little bit longer. Yeah, there are, a, um, I mean, I've known them more succinctly as called the Traveling Nurses Program, and most every hospital provides whatever their been, you know, a vehicle of choice for tapping into that. Um, so if you are near a, ho um, a hospital, say within, you know, 15 miles or so, you can tap into those programs. Um, they do tend to cannibalize the STR marketplace, though, so I'll be honest, you, they, they can be very lucrative. You can get upwards of sometimes $1,500 or, dollars or more uh, per room in your house. So um, if, if I would put it right in this like sweet spot, a middle between a long-term rental and a short-term rental, because you can get, again, tap into this marketplace that you know, wasn't previously available. Um, but when you do sign up for those services uh, or those, those um, agreements, you're, you're not gonna be able to be on Airbnb most often um, because you're, you are you know, committing your, your rooms to, um, to the hospital's use. Right. Okay, next slide, Constance. <clears throat> Any questions? I think I'm going pretty quick. If I start rattling off anything, or, or Chris, I, I mean, I'd love to turn over any questions to you too, but feel free to pepper us with questions like I mentioned. I think this is more fun when we can have, make it a dialogue. So one of the questions, one of the questions we, we do get when we have clients who are are uh, looking at uh, the um, short term rentals is what, what's the best short term rental uh, market? What what properties? Uh, what areas? What do you think uh, on on that one, Sean? Chris, you're still with me, right? I don't want to monopolize these these answers here. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm definitely here. But Sean, this is really more in your wheelhouse, uh, okay. getting into the stuff. So by all means, keep keep going. You're doing a great job. Sounds good. Chris, what's we your have... background, by the way? We didn't have a chance to chat before this. So I, I, I want to make sure I turn them over to you when they're right in your wheelhouse. Mortgages. So basically, if someone's looking to finance the property to buy to rent okay. out. So that's yeah, actually... and we have slides coming up for that shortly. We'll have great. plenty of questions. For Chris. Don't worry. <laughs> It sounds good. I just don't want to be the one that everyone's annoyed with at the end of this thing. Like, why was that one guy just talking so much? Um, so this question is a, and should very like very much like the last one is a matter of preference. Um, I have found that niching a short-term rental is probably the most way of, of, of making it as most lucrative as possible. What I mean by that is find a particular type of customer that you think would be um, amenable uh, to the, the property that you are buying or, or have bought. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, the niche that I've chosen and my, my business partners have chosen in New Hampshire is uh, one that you might, folks might laugh at, but it's actually been proven to be very lucrative um, because so few people do it. And that is we go after large groups, um, bachelor parties, bachelorette parties, bar mitzvahs, family reunions, things of that nature. Um, this is not again for everybody. <laughs> you have to have can't have a be pain of heart getting into that market. But uh, the reason that that we decided to go that route is our investment model involved buying larger places, places that have four or more bedrooms, usually five or more bedrooms actually, and that are close to say golf courses, lakes, oceans, or uh, oceans, ocean uh, views, um, uh, and other kind of amenities that would appeal to larger groups. That's been a niche that's been very um, successful for us because we'll have people come from New York, uh, Connecticut, um, New Jersey, certainly Boston, just to have to rent out a group of 14, you know, anywhere from 15, 16 to, to 20 people to, uh, to come to these, um, to our, our short term rentals. So we, we find that we found that niching was very important. Um, the other you know, so that being said, the other side of, of any rental is is all is still holds true is that, you know, location, location, location is always going to be important in real estate that I don't think is a, a tried and true rule that will never go away. So the more things you have um, near you that are going to be um, 
uh, uh, going to draw in potential customers are always going to be advantageous. Certainly, again, closer to the ocean you are, it's going to be great. The closer you are to amenities, whether that's restaurants or, or mountains, if you want to make your, you know, a ski chateau, you know. So find something. I would suggest if you're in the market for buying real estate and going into the, the uh, short-term rental marketplace, buy a place that you can be very clear from a marketing perspective how you're going to spin it. Um, don't just buy something because it's convenient to you, buy something that's going to be uh, amenable to a business model, because this is a business, you're getting into the short term market business, you're getting into the real estate business. And if you don't think through who your customer are, is, um, you'll wind up, you know, it's just throwing stuff against the wall and hoping that it sticks, as opposed to going in it with a plan. Um, well, one of the things that um, you just said, um, uh, I've been in been on both sides of this. I've sold properties to two clients who are um, interested in getting into the short-term rentals. And I've also been in the short-term rental. Um, um, and, and my, my personal advice is that um, you do consider properties that um, are closer by um, to where you live. It'd be very difficult for me being on the coast to service a property, for example, in Greenland. So um, uh, for, for myself and my, my clients that, that uh, might live on the coast, I've recommended some beach areas or, or the, the, um, the lakes, also another area close by. Um, difference between the beach area and the lakes area um, is the lakes area can be a 12 month a year uh, short-term rental. The beach area tends to be uh, about a, a, a four to five month uh, short term rental and then a um, six, seven to eight month um, long term long term rental. So if you're um, if you're in Hampton, where I, I just um, uh, sold a property to a client, um, their plan is get as much as they can during the summer months out, out of that property, charge as much as they can for short-term rentals during that period of time. And then they'll use the other uh, winter months to sell it, to rent it to um, pre-state project um, uh, individuals who might be here looking for um, a long-term a long-term property themselves, purchase pro property themselves. Not sure which area that they're going to, going to move to. But they need some place to um, need uh, some place to stay for six eight months while they're deciding which area they're going to live in in New Hampshire. Um, and I find that to be a pretty good plan for the beach area. Um, I have a I have a question, Sean. I I own long term rentals near Elliott Hospital, which isn't the greatest neighborhood, but I've kind of been reluctant to switch any of them to short-term rentals just because it isn't the best neighborhood. Do you have any thoughts on that? What What about that middle camp that we talked about earlier? Why not open it up to the hospital for traveling nurses? And they, they're, they're one of the benefits of that program is they are in your space so uh, infrequently they basically you, you know, sleep there <laughs> and then they, then they go and back to the, to the hospital. Um, so that the location um, being good or bad actually doesn't matter as much for that program. And you could, you might be able to do three times what you're doing now in, in the long-term market, switch into the nurse traveling nurses program. Yeah. Manchester is absolutely perfect for that because of Elliott hospital. And they do use, they do use um, contract um, medical professionals there. And it's a, it's, and they pay, very large, um, uh, very, very high prices for rental properties. Yeah, my, my son works at Elliott Hospital and currently walks from one of, to, to work from one of the properties that we own. Yeah. How is Conway for a, an area to rent short term? I, <clears throat> tourist. Yeah, I was, I was about to say, uh, what are the local uh, ski mountains? Uh, What's the furthest ski mountain in Conway? Give or take. Gunstock. Gunstock. Yeah, I mean, it, it really does, to, to, uh, my, my viewpoint, my view of the world rather is that 
you can make a short term rental out of any, you, you know, you can uh, turn any lemon into lemonade if it's the right marketing pitch, if you find the right use for it uh, for a customer. Um, so again, Conway, you know, if you want to, I, again, I'm, I'm not as familiar with, with, with it specifically, but if you uh, say did have great tourism there, if you had great ski mountains that were within half hour or 45 minutes, then again, it becomes a marketing challenge more than it becomes a short term rental challenge. Which is again, a, a one more piece that I think is kind of fun about it is you can, the way that you, sh you list your, your uh, property, you can have fun with it. You can, the marketing side of it, you know, if you, anyone has any marketing interests or enjoyment behind that part of it, you can really start talking up the features, the amenities of certainly of the home, but also the amenities and what it's near. And all of that plays well, um, into the search uh, algorithm of these platforms. So that if someone is looking for a ski home near them or a, uh, you know, a, a place to go leaf peeping, you can incorporate those keywords into the listing to really kind of capture that market. I'll just have, uh, just before we leave this slide, I'll just emphasize one of the other things you said before, Sean, and that is that um, unfortunately there are towns and, and communities that are regulating uh, short-term rentals. Um, as you have uh, Hampton Beach, for example, takes a, a, um, a special a special license in order to have uh, your property uh, classified as a uh, short-term uh, short-term rental property. Um, as I found out, it wasn't very difficult to get for for my for my client, but um, it was it was very important that you deal with a real estate agent who's familiar with this area. I knew about it, and I knew that uh, prior to us um, buying the property, it was included in our contract that the seller had to uh, get that license or that permit uh, prior to uh, prior to closing for, for us. Jack, was your client uh, Sean? Yes. Yeah, so we're working with him now. Um, yeah, yeah. You, so, you're working with him because I referred to you, Sean. Oh, of course. <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, small world. Small free state, oh. I should say. <laughs> Thank you, Jack, for that. That was great. But yeah, that's a really good point is that have, you know, certainly uh, do not buy a short term rental without doing your homework into the city as well, uh, you know, the city ordinances and the, the, um, the various laws that are in place and policy around short term rentals. Um, like I said, I, I, I would, frankly, I'd put Portsmouth pretty much right out right now. And there's several other townships that just don't play nice with short term rentals for whatever reason, good, bad or otherwise, uh, you know, we're all, we're all not fans of government. So I, I won't speak on that point, but it, they, they like to poke their nose and <laughs> voluntary, uh, you know, exchange, but, um, but yeah, that is certainly something as you're entering into this market, make sure you know what town you're going into and what the laws are around short term rentals, which usually are published right on the town website. That's right. And, um, uh, a bear hunting lodge in Grafton or be fine. Um, didn't, didn't get any any smile on that one. <laughs> we'll go to, go to the next slide. <laughs> am I am I on mute or am I on? Yeah, question on, I have: what, what really distinguishes the difference between a month to month lease for a long term tenant versus short term rental? Um. Well, the difference is, is the month to month lease your, well, several things. I would start with the most obvious one is a, any sort of long-term lease, whether it's month to month or any other, the tenant is bringing all of their own stuff. They're, right. they're, they're loading up their own, you know, uh, couches and sofas and TVs and their clothes and washing machine and whatever else. So, I mean, like getting someone um, in there um, after a, a month, is over is not always uh, the easiest thing. You also, mm -hmm. again, you, you do need to fully furnish a short-term rental. So that's Correct. the difference. Um, that's a big difference. So um, that's probably the most obvious that this, other than that, um, you know, and the, the kind of general things that go along with leases is again, you're, you're incumbent to deal with all the regulatory hurdles that come along with the lease you have to have a, you know you can be subject to um again forbearance you know is something that a lot of people went through especially in 2020 and where they just stopped paying you and they can just do that um you got to be subject to them you know to uh you know 
any process involved with eviction should they decide not to pay you. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's a lot of logistical hurdles that go along with that, um, that just don't come along with short term rentals. And, and again, like, like Sean said, uh, you have to read the, the, um, the town's um, rules on this. Uh, there, some of them are fairly cleverly written that have a minimum, typically a minimum of 30 days, uh, but they also have a limitation on the number of, of days that the owner of the property is not in possession of the property. So they're, they're, some, some of these laws are fairly cleverly written to um, avoid what would be the typical um, weekend Airbnb or the one, you know, uh, one week Airbnb. Uh, again, you just have to read the law. One other, since we are trucking down the conversation about law, one of a, does anyone here ever read Tom Wheelwright? By any way, he's a CPA for, um, uh, what's his name? The Rich Dad Poor Dad, Robert Kawasaki. No, yeah. uh, anyway, he, he just was, he's on a great, this great podcast, by the way, if I could, other than, you know, get off my, you know, conversation here, if you're like, goes in one ear out the other, or you're not taking notes, highly recommend uh, two different podcasts. If folks listen to podcasts, one's called Wealth Without Wall Street, which is a phenomenal arsenal of information about short-term rentals. Those guys have been doing it for a while and they give a tremendous amount of information, a lot more than I will probably on this call. Uh, another one's called the Infinite Wealth Podcast. And that was the one where Tom Wheelwright was just on last week. They gave a tremendous overview of some benefits, uh, some tax code changes that just took place, as well as some benefits of short-term rentals for tax purposes. Um, one that he brought up, which I thought, I didn't even know this until I was listening to this, but it was very interesting is when you do short-term rentals, all your income is classified as active income. Whereas when you do uh, long-term rentals, you're usually, and depending on your CPA anyway, but most 99% mm. of the time it's, it's, it's called passive income. And so any losses can't be deducted against active income streams, such as if you have a W-2. Um, whereas when you do short-term, you can do that. Um, again, you have to work with a very talented CPA and you have to have certain criteria that you meet, but um, Tom Wheelwright's a tremendous again. asset. Can you say that again? Is, is short-term income Passive or active? Active. Short-term income, depending on certain requirements. I, you know, I'm, I'm not a tax guy, so don't take this as advice. But uh, from again, the, the Tom Real Right Real Rights conversation, um, and from my own experience, all short-term income is classified as active, A C T I V E, meaning that if you do experience a loss um, for some reason in your first year or so, um, that can be written off as a business expense on a Schedule C, as opposed to a Schedule E, which is usually long-term rentals, um, which is passive income and cannot be written off against um, W-2 income. What, what was the second podcast, Infinite? Infinite uh, oh. Wealth Podcast, yeah. Okay. Now, I, I might have an interesting situation that I have to think about, is because I purchased a, a duplex with the intent that the downstairs is a long-term rental it came with a with a renter and the upstairs being about a 600 square foot one bedroom one living room kitchen etc would be a short term short term hopefully you know furnished hopefully for visiting nurses have i overcomplicated things by having the two types in the same building no i don't think so i think that you, <laughs> that's what's so great about investing in general and real estate is you can be as do what's right mm -hmm. for you mm -hmm. 100 percent. yeah because the downstairs basically covers every anything so anything get anything again in the short term should be somewhat gravy again yeah. hoping yeah. for visiting nurses because i'm here in alstead walpole across from bellows falls i'm within 20 minutes of three hospitals and within 40 minutes of less than 40 minutes of dartmouth and that's right up 91. I and I know there's, a, there's, there's an active market market for that. And then thinking that I might do overnights or whatever, you know, if I'm between visiting nurse clients. I think that's great. I, I, I see no, no flaws with that plan okay. other than the market. <laughs> you know, yeah, you're know. always going to be, uh, that's the only, I probably should have mentioned that at the onset. That's the only other thing of short-term rentals that you don't have um, with long-term rentals is you're completely con um, at the mercy of the marketplace. So you might go weeks or even months without not get, without getting a stay sometimes, whereas with long-term rentals, you're guaranteed to get that check every month. So 
Sure. Take that, take that, <laughs> you know, in, <laughs> with a grain of salt, but that is, that is certainly an important piece of the business model you want to make sure is factored into your calculus. Absolutely. All right, Chris, that looks like a slide for you. Hey everyone. So what's the purchase process for short-term rentals? It's really similar to buying any home. Uh, it's going to depend on what type of property it is that you're buying. If you're buying a single family house or a condo, then you would probably want to classify it as a second home because that way you could buy it, excuse me, with as little as 10% down. If you're getting into a multifamily, then that is by default going to be considered an investment property, meaning investment is just a term in lending, meaning you don't live in there. Um, and then that's going to be at least 25% down. But if you can purchase a property that is a second home slash a vacation property, then you can do that at 10% down. And it would just be normal conventional financing the way you would with any other loan that you would buy. Uh, the big difference, if you're buying a property and you're classifying it as a second home, you cannot use any of the potential rental income from that property to help offset your debt to income ratio to you know, add to your income to help qualify for it. You can only do that when the property is classified as an investment property, non-owner occupied property. And are there any, um, are there any downsides on the non-owner occupied um, other than the um, the, the amount of the down payment, more interest? I mean, well, as far as the loan is concerned, you're the, on both the in, uh, second home vacation property and investment properties, the interest rates are much, much higher and uh, the fees are higher. Uh, second homes used to be identical to owner occupied homes up until about a year ago. And Fannie and Freddie made the switch and basically the fees are almost identical to, to an investment property. So to give you an idea, today at 10% down, a single family owner occupied home is in the low sixes. A uh, single family vacation home is around seven with about two and a half points. Mm. And I will just say that this market is beyond volatile where the, you know, tomorrow that could be completely different by a quarter, half a percent. It is in the beyond volatile market, but that gives you an idea of the difference in where your rate and fees are. So it's about a percent higher with, um, you know, quite a few, a little bit extra in closing costs. So, um, you know, the, on the, on the, not the financing, but on the finance side, I know when I'm, um, when I have a client, and I'm looking at, at these types of this type of property or a multi a multi-family property. Um, I'm I'm typically looking at cash on cash returns. So uh, when you're looking when you're looking at this from the point of view of cash on cash return, and then incorporating um, uh, you know interest rates that can be um, this high at at least. Um, hearing 7% interest doesn't knock my client out of the ballpark from having a, um, uh, a cash on cash returns in, in the 18, 18% to, to 25% range, even at a 7% um, uh, financing rate. Uh, it might sound, might sound funny, but um, when, you're, um, when you're analyzing the, these types of properties, whether it's a Short term or a uh, a multifamily, it's really going to be that cash on cash return. In other words, how much cash? Uh, what's what's the return to my client based on the cash they actually have invested, not the return they're getting on the property as a whole? Um, it's a it's a different number. Do you agree with that, Chris? I do, and that's a great point to bring up because so many people get hung up on what the interest rate is. And obviously we all want 0% for an interest rate, but it's the one thing no one has any control over. At the end of the day, if you're buying one of these properties, you're buying it to make money. 
So it comes down to whatever your monthly expense is for whatever the interest rate is on the home. What is that expense versus what you have, you know, including what you have to put into it for down payment, closing costs and stuff to what you're going to get back out of it. And it's that number that you need to take into consideration when buying a property, because sure, the rates are higher, but if, if you can get the return on it, then what does it matter? You know, at the end of the day, it's, it's how much money you're going to make. That's right. So um, there, there are several, there are several, um, um, there are several other ways that I, I vet uh, properties um, with clients um, to begin with. Um, and um, of course, cash on cash is one of them. Um, I also look at gross rent multipliers and um, and the like. Um, Amber, do you, do you have some, something to add to to any of, of that on financing and selecting the right multifamily property? Um, no, I feel like you guys are explaining it very very thoroughly. Um, Chris, is there anything else you want to add? Does anybody have any questions about financing? Um, short-term, um, short-term properties. I can think I of it. I mean, my biggest, my biggest recommendation for anyone that's looking to buy a place, whether it's as an investment or as an owner occupancy is, you know, it's really the place, you know, look, look at, look for the place. Don't get hung up on or as hung up on what is the market doing today? What are the rates doing today? Because that stuff's going to change. Generally, when you buy a home to live in or you're buying a home for an investment, you're not buying it to make a, you know, a quick giant profit in a couple of years. You're buying it as an investment. So what is this going to return to you over time? And, and that should be the deciding factor, not what's going to happen in the next six months with prices or interest rates or whatever. That, that would be my biggest recommendation. Sean, you've purchased some large large expensive properties um, for the type of business you're you're involved in um, and how's that working for you so far it's working great knock on wood <laughs> I uh, um, asked me again in a, in a year but um, but yeah I, I definitely believe in real estate um, it's in my blood and uh, I took some you know big I was going to use the word gamble, but that's not right. I took some calculated risks um, because I've done this for now, um, better part of 11 years. And um, what's kind of great, what, what I think is really great about this, this business is that you're, you know, you get success in a small way. You take your first baby step and then you'll get confident and, and more confidence in taking the next step. And that, and before you know it, you're built, you're buying a second place or a third place um, because it really, the model really does work. It produces cash flow unlike anything else that I've seen in, in other, in other uh, in, in environments and other industries. Um, and that cash flow is all in your control. That's what, what's one of my personal, again, I'm a Kawasaki fan. I really love his, his work, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, mm -hmm. if you never read it, Cash Flow Quadrant, amazing book. Um, I really believe in buying investments that you have control over and real estate is the number one asset that you have complete control over. You can pivot, you can switch, you can change your, your, you know, your, your game plan. If short term isn't working, you can pivot and go into long term. If long term's not working, you can pivot, go in, you know, in, in, and and put, you know, nurses in there. I mean, there's so many opportunities um, in that space, which is which is great. And one of the things uh, I, I do want to say, just to dovetail on what Chris was mentioning, and and well, you as well, Jack, and the cash on cash return. I don't know if anyone else here has bought short-term short rentals, been doing it at all, but if you do have success in the space, um, there's nothing wrong with, with seeking out investor capital. That could be fr even friends and family. It's like enough to put down a 10 or 20% or down payment, and then you have an infinite return because then you're able to basically use investor capital to buy additional uh, rentals. And you know, to the points that have been made, you know, the, the actual interest rate on the loan is, is less consequential to your uh, cash on cash return. Um, I've not personally done that myself, but I've, I, again, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts and people really do swear by that model um, uh, when you're looking at it through the right, right lens. Um, and there are people that are using rentals. They're just signing leases with the owner's permission. 
and setting them up as short-term <clears throat> rentals. So they're not even purchasing. Mm -hmm. um, so then their investment is the furnishings and and making the income from from a long-term landlord into a short-term. It's a great point, Candace or Constance. Uh, the, the the what we call the uh, arbitrage model. Um, a lot of friends are doing that, and it works tremendously well as well. So just to explain how that works, um, you did a great job you know, mentioning, but uh, but just to go into the details is basically you would sign a, a 12 month or even a 36 month lease with a landlord, rent their place, you're gonna be their best friend because you're, you know, you're you pay on time, you, you take good care of the place, you know, you've established a relationship. And then what you do is you then rent out that that apartment or that condo on, on the short term rental. So you might have a twelve hundred or thousand yeah. dollar a month pay payment to them as rent, but then you're collecting four, five, six thousand dollars a month in income. So there's so, you're subletting, right? You're subletting. Yep, yep. You're you're arbitraging the opportunity. Yeah, exactly. That's right. You're you're sub the, the the landlord has to allow you to sublet. Right. Um, and some of them don't. But again, if you have established a good partnership or a good working um, relationship with a landlord. Um, then it's, it becomes a no-brainer for them. They're getting a 36 or even five-year agreement out of the deal, and you're able to take advantage of, a, of an asset without actually buying it. <laughs> so it's another great way of doing this. Constance, you want to go to the next slide? <clears throat> some of this, um, some of this, um, Some of this we discussed a bit, bit earlier. Um, uh, Sean, do you, do you have anything to add? Or does anybody have any questions about um, the management and maintenance of, of the short term rental and, and the time that it takes? Because um, it's, it's, not, it's not the same as a, a multifamily. You have to go in on Sundays and clean toilets. <laughs> well, not always, but hey, does anyone here? doing short term or is this basically trying this the uh, mostly folks trying to kick the can uh, kick the tires on this and they haven't started getting into it yet i have a property that we're turning into a short term rental property it's five plus beds five bedrooms plus other sleep spaces too so what you said earlier was interesting to me but the house needs a lot of fixing up it has a view of a lake in croydon oh wow uh, mm -hmm. Um, and there's public access to the lake not far from the house. Um, and we're near skiing and, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. So uh, we just think it's pretty ideal. We looked at some comps at, I could tell you the website. It was an interesting one. Um, AirDNA.com? That was not it. Um, let me see. It's... Uh, Rabu, R A B B U. They were, and they told you what you could get on the short term marketplace? Yeah, based on local comps. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So it looks promising. Um, and it, and we got the house for a song. It's just because it really needed a lot of work. Sure. Um, so we're putting the work into the house, which is why it's not going to be ready till next year, hopefully in the spring. We're hoping to winterize it now and then do the interior during the winter. Um, well, your question earlier makes a lot more sense now. I guess. <laughs> exactly. And even then I'm thinking longer term, like sure in the spring, but you know, five years down the road, that market, who knows, right? It could completely change. You just don't know. Long term. Then you still have a house. Done. Then we sell a house. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That, that is the other option. Yeah. And one of the things that Sean and I talked before we did a talk like this at Forecast, but, but, you know, like if it makes sense cash flow long-term rental and then you can and then you can make five to six times more revenue with short-term rental then for whatever reason if you if you do have to turn it back like you're not out of out money out of your pocket at least that I would be more comfortable about you know purchase, purchasing something that that had the potential to at least break out even with a long-term rental than than on short-term rental, unless it was already established. Yeah. Well, that's well, probably a good, a good conversation. I don't know if it's in this slide deck or not, but uh, I think risk appetite is a is a good way of putting it. Is there is a difference in risk 
um, and I probably alluded to this earlier, uh, but between a short-term rental and, and a long-term rental. So, um, and what that's one of the things, again, just to plug a little bit about what, what we do at, at Managed BNB is we try to, to de-risk the experience for our, our customers. So a lot of our, or all of our customers are those that are looking for a uh, turnkey solution. They want to, they want to have the short-term uh lucrative cash flow without having to get in there to, to you know your points earlier and scrubbing toilets you know <laughs> or, or uh you know taking on the risk or the, the, the property management hurdles that come along with that so you know working with a property management company that can basically make your investment um passive is is taking it to the next level um it doesn't have to be done day one again you, you know, certainly we encourage Anyone who's getting into short-term rental to try it out for themselves and, and see where they if it is if it's their investor DNA, um, and if it if it, it does and it's in your blood, then by all means, hundred percent go go for it and do it you know do it uh, as much as uh, to the best of your ability and, and beyond. Um, but if at some point if you get to that point where you're where you're plateauing and you're like I just can't do this I don't have the time the effort the energy what have you, then you know you can make a, still a tremendous amount of money and have someone else manage your property. And where are you located and, you know, where do you do your management? So our company is located on the seacoast here in New Hampshire, but we, we take on properties all throughout the entire East Coast. So we have properties that we manage in Vermont, Maine, certainly New Hampshire. Um, we're bringing on a property in, in New York um, in a couple of weeks. So the, again, we're, what we do is our, our kind of niche is we bring in the talent that is literally boots on the ground in whatever area that we're in, no more than than five mile, five five ten miles away, and utilize those those vendors, you know, cleaning crews, um, you know, uh, uh, lawn services, whatever the property needs to be well kept up and maintained, and then we use uh, technology to just ensure that the the place is is properly uh, inspected and QA'd using pictures and video and whatnot to uh, you know using the the security uh, apparatus that involving um, you know making sure that the the place is secure and, and maintained so That's a, uh, that, which is a great segue to the next slide if you can put the next slide up because uh, part of that is um, 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 of resources and tips. Resources and tips. Do you, do resources you and tips. Oh, do you want to skip the RV one? Um, well, we can do the RV, but we don't have the RV speaker, do we? I could talk a little bit about it, but okay. if, if if everybody is interested in short-term real estate rentals, then let's just skip it because I'm I haven't started it, but I've been looking into it. Um, basically, I. I rented an RV for next year for Porkfest, and then I was like, you know what? The interest rates for uh, for RVs are, are is actually pretty comparable to 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 uh, um, you know buying a house now, and you can get a really nice RV for sixty eighty thousand. You cannot buy a nice house in New Hampshire for sixty eighty thousand, and the the nightly rentals for RV are actually pretty comparable to some short term rentals. So I I'm I'm definitely exploring that as something um, I might consider getting into in the future. You could actually be an, 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 another interesting topic. Now, are you actually talking about renting the RV in a static spot or renting the RV so that somebody can take it with them? Uh, class, probably a class uh, C where they can drive it. Yeah. Um, I, I see a lot and kind of uh, also with the short-term rental, you know, as the economy gets worse, like a lot of people are going to be vacationing closer to home. Right. Um, so I see families still wanting to take a vacation, but they might not want to go as far. They might want to not mm -hmm. stay in night, stay in grandma's guest room. But if they haven't, I mean, I, I did this. I went to Alaska, ran an RV, parked in my in law, my former in laws' driveway, traveled around Alaska. So, so I can see it uh, being uh, a type of you know, people don't want. Lots of people buy them and then they park them in their 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 driveway. Most well, they could be time. renting them out, right? So, so it's it's something I'm interested in, but you know, mm -hmm. a little busy at the moment, so I haven't really uh, started that. But I actually have a friend in uh, Florida who I'm talking to about potentially splitting the time where the RV is in New Hampshire versus Florida, so nice. that way it have to be winterized and not make. Well, 
three of the years that we ran at Forkfest, we dealt with an operation out of Concord and it was great. They delivered the RV to the site. We opened the, you know, got the keys, opened the door, left it when, when Forkfest was over. They picked it up. I mean, it is a nice service like that. But the other thing, other thing I'm interested in possibly uh, again, probably for a future seminar would be, what about offering a site for somebody to park an RV? Yeah, and there are short-term rentals that are yurts, there are campsites. I mean, if you go on the sites, you'll see like, you know, here's a tent that's set up next to a river, bring your gear in. So, so there are definitely other opportunities other than just housing. Like mm -hmm. vacation housing. Just one thing on that your your last point of um, again that's going to be a town issue, right? Or, or not you can you can have um, an operating RV on for a particular period of time. Mm -hmm. but, um, just in interest of time, if we get to um, resources and tips. Yeah, exactly. Did you have some comments on on that, Amber? Um, resources and tips. Let me pull that up real quick. Um, oh yeah, a really good tip that I've heard is that you can use um, electronic locks with combos for your short-term rentals that you can change periodically or change when your guest leaves. Uh, no, yeah, that's why I have them. I did that on my upstairs unit. That's going to be the short term. Yeah, and I've stayed at a couple places that they will actually reach out to me and ask what code I prefer which I really liked. That way you don't forget it. You pick something that you're familiar with that you won't forget and nobody else is going to know. I thought that was a really neat little trick. Um, I, another place I've stayed at has had uh, ring doorbells installed so they can see who's coming and going from the property to make sure that only the people who have registered to stay there are using That's good. Taking advantage. The, uh, bring up something about uh, the short-term rental part, just another something to think about. Um, and, and it's only because I saw my in-laws do this where, you know, they bought their retirement home. It was actually in Rhode Island where they're from, but they bought that and it was next to the beach, but not on it. So it didn't have a decimal point in it. And <laughs> they, for the last, last couple of years, they've uh, done it, you know, through VRBO or whatever site. And run it out, and they were able to pay well over half of it off, and you know now they're moving into it. So they knew they weren't keeping it for short-term rental, but they knew they couldn't move into it for a handful of years, and they did that as a way to significantly pay down the mortgage that was on it. Just as you know, another idea for people if they're thinking about mm -hmm. coming here but can't come yeah, I've, now. I have friends who did that down in Georgia, had a rental property that they eventually retired into. But for the years that they were purchasing it, they rented it out. Exactly the same thing. Right. So one I of the, one of the tricks. Sean, is, oh, sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say one of the tricks is something that Sean mentioned earlier when you were talking about websites is the air D and air um, DNA. Air DNA. Yeah. For looking up potential. Air B and A. DNA. D is in dog. D and A ah. is in. Apple. Yeah. Okay. But uh, but there was another one that actually. What was the one that you uh used? Uh, was it fru Frubu? I, I didn't. I need to type. Rabu. Rabu. Yeah. R a b b u. Yeah, I haven't used that one. Uh, Air DNA does charge. So uh, does does Rubu? Rabu. 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 Uh, Sorry, I'm gonna write it down so I don't. There you go. <laughs> it's a free the chat, guys. You can type in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, you can type it in the chat. Um, just, um, just a couple things um, that um, uh, before you get that uh, ring doorbell uh, recording in, in, your, in a premise that you're leasing uh, out or, or have an Airbnb, I understand that um, it is illegal to do recordings and uh, audio and sound recordings in New Hampshire. Um, and um, so you can use it to see who's at the door and who's who's walking in and out, but um, don't set it to record. Um, did so, but, sorry, Amber, Constance, Constance, I have a point. I can't type into the chat. I can only send it to you and the co-hosts, not to everybody, not to Sean. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, if you put it in there, I'll send it back yeah. out to everyone. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Great. 
And um, Amber, um, I don't do Facebook, but um, uh, you had some some recommendations on Facebook sites and um, um, also um, some YouTube. Is that right? Yeah, uh, you can find a group for anything on Facebook. So there's tons <laughs> of that will talk about short term rentals, um, RV rentals, and you can you know pick their brains, learn from their experiences, so you don't make the same mistakes. So my question for Sean actually is management costs. I, I, I wanted to continue down that avenue before when you were talking about it. Um, yes. An open-ended question or uh, did you have a specific question about it? I mean, you might be uh, like higher end because you're all over the place, but what would you expect to pay a management company to run your Airbnb? We're, we're, we are a flat fee. We do um, 20%. Um, and we base uh, the first year off of a pro forma. So we'll free of charge, we'll put together for anybody who asks um, uh, pro forma, meaning what do they expect to make within a year's of, uh, of us managing their, their listing. Um, again, we have 12 years of experience doing it. So we're, we're, we're not having that initial ramp up period that a lot of folks do. You know, they don't, you know there's a lot of things that a lot of, um, snake bites you can avoid um, on the on the roadway to getting a successful listing up, um, which we probably wouldn't even be able to scratch the surface of in a, in a quick call like this. But uh, in general, yeah, to answer your question briefly, uh, we do 20%. We do the first a year based on the pro forma, and then the second year is based on actuals. Uh, and we manage it soup to nuts. There is not a single piece of it that we do not handle everything from the listing of the, of the, um, the actual real estate um, on the platforms to managing the guest experience to setting up the vendors uh, and everything in between. So it's um, it makes it a completely passive experience for the for the investor. And what's the name of your company? Managed M A N A G E D Airbnb or excuse me, my comp the company's named is Managed B N B, but the air the URL you can check us out is managedairbnb.com. And I'd love to have a sidebar with you if you wanted to schedule, schedule a meeting anytime this sure. or next week. I'd love that. I can actually put my phone number in the you chat think, here. You think you can, but <laughs> you yeah. can. I, will, I, will, I will reach out. <laughs> is, is there a minimum for the property? I mean, for example, my little unit is going gonna, gonna to be running between 800 and 1,000 a month. So 20% would be you know, 160 to 200. Is that too small for you? I, we'd certainly take the phone call. I, we typically do larger homes or homes that are, uh, you know, uh, on a, uh, you know, a, a lake or ocean or, or something right. in, in the air. That being said, uh, again, free, you guys are all, uh, you know, free, uh, fr uh, part of the free state. We'll talk to anybody. <laughs> I would love to do business with anyone here. And I'd certainly, I could talk with the team and make an exception. So yeah, please. Yeah, uh, that's what, I mean, again, I, I came into this, it, it was a lucky thing that I came on it. And I'm coming in at very small scale at this point. Sure. So that's why I decided, am I going to be managing because it's a mile from my house or do I have to, do I want to find somebody else to actually manage it for me? Well, let's have the conversation. I, okay. again, we, I do actually, I do recommend to anyone who's looking to get started in this space. Uh, I mean, obviously I'm a business guy. I'm going to be tooting my own horn, but I do think that there is value in learning how to do anything yourself yeah. uh, as, a, as a sole proprietor so that you know, how to uh, at least know the questions to ask. You know, sometimes the, the first six, the three to six months just getting involved with a new business, because this is a business. This is not just a throw money in the stock market and I hope it does well, uh, or more, import more importantly, I hope it doesn't lose half its out value overnight. Um, this is an actively managed business um, when you do it yourself. And so learning that and getting involved with it from that lens is very important. Um, and then, and then, and only then, once you realize, all right, I, I understand the pitfalls, I understand the the, the, um, the benefits, but I do want to have it managed. I, I don't have the time or the patience to do it myself. And you know, uh, Shakespeare said, "Know thyself." So, I mean, if if that's not something you want to be doing with your time, then we'll certainly we'd love to help you out. But it does it does make sense to try it out for yourself, so you can get to know the business that you're getting involved with. I make the same recommendations for long-term rentals, but there's definitely people that can't do it. Like they can't, because I say it's like you're buying yourself a job when you buy an investment property. Right. And, and there are people that have too many jobs already and they just really can't 
do it. So it's okay to put it directly into management <laughs> if, if that's where you're at. I, I mean, I'll add that marketing isn't my thing, right? I want to make sure it's marketed right so that we get the right clientele. And I'd rather have somebody who knows what they're doing at yeah. the go. I'll jump in later if you want, you know, but um, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Well, I will share in this chat, maybe it can get um, communicated out to everybody, our URL and feel free to look us up. Um, and um, I would love to have a conversation with any and all of you anytime um, you want. So we're, we'd love to help you out. Yeah, uh, Amber actually already shared it, but I realized I shared your phone number back to you. So let me share it with everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. There you go. All right, and we are actually over time. So do anybody, anybody have anything else they wanna add? Yeah, thank you very much. This was very helpful. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you panelists for all your wonderful information. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Catch you later. Bye. Bye. Thank you. I can't get out of here.